folks. So I'm going to uh, just keep kind of plowing through because uh, apparently the end of the semester is here, um, which may have caught many of us by surprise. Um, but yeah, so I'm just going to keep uh, recording these videos. Um, I'd encourage you to view them. I mean, but uh, all the content that all the key content is in the slides themselves. Uh, and so my commentary is not essential to uh, you passing this class. Um, so yeah, um, I'm just going to keep going. Um, Archie, sorry, I've got chaos in with four paws. Hey, no. Oh. Uh. Um, I'm just going to leave this running for uh, a nanosecond to catch the culprit so you can at least be entertained. Ah. Whoop! Okay. Archie! Hey! Hey, hey, hey! Hey, this, this dumb dumb. Oops. Hey! He's discovered that uh, boxes are very entertaining, <sighs> including boxes that have things that shouldn't have cats in them. Uh, anyway, let's let's just keep going. Sorry. Uh, hopefully the uh, antics are at least entertaining. Um. Yeah. So boom. So, uh, last time we kind of talked about old school ways and Wexler and all those, but here's, um, now there is a fourth edition, but um, try, I'm trying to keep it consistent with a textbook that many of you possess, but not universally. Um, there, there is an upgraded edition, but the ideas are still the same. And um, if any of you end up working with pre-existing data, which um, seems likely if you continue on your experiences in graduate school. Um, uh, it's helpful to um, to get kind of familiar with it. Yeah. All right. So that's that's Suki. Um, he has learned um, that if he circles like a shark, he gets attention. He is. Ooh literally out of frame. Hey, what you doing? Yeah, these are how my um faculty meetings have been too. There's, uh, there's, yeah, anyway, um, again, hopefully you at least find this entertaining. I mean, I, otherwise I would edit this out and re-record. Um, but yeah, so okay, so uh, I'm gonna kind of break it down by um, kind of broad scale. So the waste three has a verbal scale, which taps into lots of different aspects of verbal ability. Uh, and so the subtests are listed here. So you've got vocabulary, which taps. Skill knowledge, um, unlike original kind of versions of these, like so, like the 19, the early, super early dawn of the 20th century versions of these tests were a little more haphazard. And so here, breaking down kind of the deliberate skills being tapped and kind of recognizing that the tests are a sampling of the domain that we're interested in and. Uh, so trying to be mindful that they're representative or try and have the test be representative of the skill you're tapping. And so that's why like they're really nicely well documented um, aspects of each scale that are they're trying to be deliberate. And so vocabulary taps word knowledge, similarities test taps both abstract and divergent thinking, ar the arithmetic subtest, which is more like a verbal it's more like um, word problems than like the actual math. Like the 
math is pretty basic. Uh, it's more to see if you can like synthesize and extract that information from it. Um, and so that taps concentration as well as working memory. Um, digits band, which is similar to the uh, Stanford Binet, um, taps into active working memory. Information just is fun. I uh, I really enjoy some of the phrasing that I found. So fund of knowledge is like verbatim reproduced. Um, comprehension tax and taps into social and moral reasoning and judgment. I this is the one I have a little bit of problem with because it has some value in it, but it's still at least deliberate and thoughtful. And last we have letter number sequencing, which taps into concentration and working memory. You'll notice that many of these um, have some overlap and that's deliberate so that um, there's commonality uh, because you don't want these test concepts to be like totally divergent because it, it would be really hard to interpret them and it's likely not tapping the same construct. And so the fact that we see repeats is kind of a, is deliberate. Um, so the performance scale, which is separate from the uh, verbal scale taps kind of um, all that not most nonverbal is not the right word, but that's how I think about it. Uh, it's all that non word stuff. Um, so picture completion, digit symbol. So this is a coding skill task. I have done the coding skill test. It is oh, if, if you have any fine motor coordination issues. Oof. Um, thankfully, my matrix reasoning uh, cancels it out, which is really nice. But um, and that's another reason why I, I like I personally appreciate te tests that have broad domains so that if you have a slight gap, it doesn't like totally tank your score from a like personal standpoint. Um, so but these try and kind of if you so if you pull up the, the slide version of this and not the video, you can kind of superimpose and see how there's a lot of, there's some overlap between these two scales. Um, block design, matrix reasoning, picture arrangement, symbol search, um, and object assembly. Like these all tap tap into like reasoning and kind of ability to put all that information together without leaning heavily on verbal aspects. And this this was deliberate in order to kind of recognize that not that the uh, verbal subscale tended to be overrepresented or almost universally overrepresented in um, in in early tests. Okay, so I had about four minutes of recording uh, that I lost because I paused and then went to go scold. Archie for being Archie. He's too enthusiastic. Again, not his problem. So um, I apologize. And I also apologize if you have no idea what I'm talking about with uh, Archie and scolding him, uh, because that might have been in the slide. Um, but anyway, so I'm going to talk about some of the subtests uh, verbal ability. So vocabulary is exactly what you think it is. Uh, it's um, it's you are given a word and so you give a word and ask for definition from the test administrator standpoint from the test taker standpoint you're given a word and then you have to define it and this taps knowledge of well words and their meaning it's a really good measure of pre-morbid functioning and so what i mean by that is like intellectual cap capacity pri like prior to any trauma or illness now this typically comes up in court cases uh, where um, essentially like plaintiffs have to demonstrate usually to insurance companies uh, that are very reluctant to pay out um, that uh, their client has suffered permanent damage that has impaired their ability to do their job and that that damage is covered under insurance and it's not just like oh they're a little less they're a little on the slow side um, there have been cases uh, where insurance companies will argue, well, sure, you're 
you know, a clinical or your clinician, your doctor, and yeah, your um, IQ is 95. That's totally what you had the whole time. Mm -hmm. And so in those types of cases, it's, it's, you still have to demonstrate that you lost IQ points because of whatever the trauma was. Um, and this doesn't have to be like a specific IQ test. This can be an achievement test, but the further away in time you are, the, the less compelling the argument is about the damage that's attributable to like the insurance company. But um, it's, it's a really fascinating area. Now I have not been a expert witness, but um, I know some folks who've done it and it's kind of intriguing. Um, but one reason why uh, usually vocab is used and is it's typically one of the last test scores to be affected and so if you can demonstrate there has been kind of damage here um it's it's fairly compelling now brain damage and not just brain damage specifically but like you have a externally caused insured aspect of your life that um if you can demonstrate that it's there so because uh, verb, the verbal subtest is super stable. Like we're talking reliability is like 0.97. These are, they're solid. Um, and another reason why it's helpful to be familiar with older tests is you may have taken an older test and are using that as your baseline. And so like, even though we've been up, there is a newer version, that newer version, um, you might have to go back to make sure you've got comparable like before and after. Cool. So I'm going to keep going. Hopefully. Uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, we're definitely keep going because I've learned that if I go back, I lose the, the recording. Um, so next verbal step is similarity. So you're presented with two words and you're asked uh, how they're alike. Um, early items like so the really young ones tap. Um, Previously learned associations like how are a dog and cat alike? They're both animals, they're both pets. Like it may feel like it's almost a trick question, but they are not. Um, later items kind of in the scale um, tap more abstract reasoning like how are liberty and freedom alike? Now this can also be used to find serious psychopathology. Uh, so if you find like really idiosyncratic reasoning, stuff that's atypical, now don't overthink it, um, and because those can be a pain, uh, when I had to, uh, take kind of a whole battery of these tests within the past four, three years, it was, it was challenging because I had a lot of knowledge of how these tests were made. And so like, essentially I was talking with the clinic, like the, the test administrator and be like, well, I know you're trying, like, I tried really hard to like take my outside knowledge, but uh, there's a really big, like it's so like this formal write-up is huge. Um, and it was partially really fascinating to just see it, but uh, like at the head of it, it was like, we encourage anyone who inter like to interpret these test scores with caution, given that, uh, well, I uh, have some expertise in test administration um, and although, I tried my best, that knowledge likely percolated through. And so for some things, this was really hard with the personality stuff, especially. Um, but like, so the curse of knowledge, but in general, just don't overthink it. Um, because otherwise your test scores aren't really interpretable anyway. Uh, that is the downside of having a lot of knowledge in this area but just be upfront and transparent tends to be really helpful. But uh, when you're interpreting these scores, uh, you've got to keep that in mind. That's why they have like big write-ups kind of to talk about all these different aspects to give context to those numbers. Okay, so arithmetic. So this is frequently thought of as a math test, but it's not. It's really like super little math involved. It's more test of active working memory. So for example, um, if envelopes are 25 cents a dozen and you buy three dozen envelopes, how much change should you get back from a dollar? So uh, the answer here is 25 cents. You've got to uh, kind of work backwards. So, okay, so we have a dollar. That's 
So dollar minus three times 25 gives us 25. So we should give back a quarter. Now this is subject to the effects of anxiety, depression. This one is uh, pretty vulnerable to those things as well as cognitive deficits, just um, because you've got to break it down. Um, and there's just lots of pieces. And so if you're distracted or uh, thinking about, you know, life, uh, this this one can be affected. Um, and I've been calling it pandemic brain. <laughs> um, excuse me. Sorry about that. Uh, I had a package that I needed to sign for, which is really bizarre. Um, I've tried to do as little contact as possible. Um, but yeah. And um, okay. cool. So uh, we were right at the end of this. So arithmetic. Uh, sorry, I had to bribe the cat. Um, he's learned. It's unfortunate. <laughs> I mean, it's not. I'm glad he, he's quite bright. Tukey, anyway. Uh, the other two. Eh. Anyway, um, so this is subject to effects of anxiety and depression because it's if you have any excess cognitive load, it um, can really affect that. And so this is an area where um, we find that stereotype threat uh, kind of has some effects. So if you're focused on uh, kind of other things, uh, you your cognitive your brain is working on isn't f like fully dedicated to and that's, I mean, dedicate is not the right word, but like your brain's not like fully allocated, like all your kind of cog resources aren't just tapped into um, the the task at hand. And so you'll have a lower score as a result because you have resources allocated elsewhere. Cool. Digits span. So um, with this one, numbers are presented one per second to subjects and subjects are asked to repeat these digits forward and reverse. So these separate scores are obtained, but the scores generally are combined for reporting. This taps, and we've, we've covered this with the, the WEX, or, or not the, the uh, Stanford Binet. Um, oh boy. My, um, my snack is in the same shaped jar as the cat treats. This is gonna be unfortunate. <laughs> I think whenever I get a snack, he's going to have to get a snack. Otherwise, he's going to be very... So, yeah. Um, so this also subject to uh, anxiety, depression, and other forms. And so uh, really anything that hits that working memory and concentration piece is, is going to be a little less stable just because other aspects are tapping it. That's not to say the traits like your your score, um, your true score is probably the same, but there's just more error. You don't like these. No. These are my treats. Mm. Yeah. Treat yourself. Hey. For your own sanity. So this also subject to anxiety and depression and other forms of psychopathology. My guess is that test scores during this time are going to, like on IQ tests, are going to be lower in any area that has that working memory component and concentration just because everyone is experiencing that kind of existential anxiety and uncertainty. Which is another reason why um, many colleges have opted for universal pass fail. Wake was not one of those, but um, thankfully my department chair recognizes that uh, these grades are gonna be seriously impacted. They're gonna have more error in them. And so my plan is to lean much more heavily on the results of everything uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, yeah, and I'll be sending out an email pretty quickly later today to talk about how I decided um, that I'm going to count the homework as the final um, so that you can have less burden. It's going to be graded similarly to the last homework.
for those of you who may, who've opted to not do pass fail. So very generously, because there's a lot of error variants out there. And it seems silly. Nope. I mean, the fact that I even these performances, this is what they are, right? Um, are now constantly interrupted because my working memory is distracted in concentration by the chaos of pandemic and the dum dums. We're going to keep going. Just because, yeah. I'm already in the recording. So, yeah, cool. Let's keep going. Information. So this asks the question about general knowledge and subjects give an answer. So this taps that general fund of knowledge and also curiosity, academic achievement, and the effects of an enriched environment. Uh, like, and so this one's very culturally bound. And so how many senators come from each state in the United States? The answer currently is two. Um, it would take a constitutional convention or amendment to change that. But some of these questions are context dependent. So if you were to take um, a test that asks how many states are there in the United States, um, it would depend on what how old your test is. Now, hopefully, the test administrator will recognize that there are now 50. But if you were to take like the original ways, um, there are many fewer states than 50. If you were to ask me right now, I could tell you there are definitely less than 48. Back then, the uh, last two states are. Um, Alaska and Hawaii. And that was in the 50s. Again, this is that uh, cognitive kind of that short term memory aspect because of all the chaos. So this taps general knowledge and it's it is associated with openness to experience. Um, verbal ability in like and IQ tests have some association with openness uh, because of that intellectual curiosity aspect. It's not super strong. But just like uh, test grades have an aspect of conscientiousness to them, because typically the more time and hard work you put in, the better you do, as you likely learned as a Wake Forest student. Um, so, yeah. Um, but the same kind of aspect here can flow through. So, it, so verbal tests have that aspect. Cool. Let's keep going. Comprehension. So this has three different types of questions, um, and they're typically is, so like appropriate responses to hypothetical scenarios. What is the thing you do if you see someone lying in the street? Um, uh, this also taps like so. Um, Pre-pandemic, you would try and help them, hopefully. Um, Post-pandemic, and uh, let's. These, yeah, let's let's not even go there. Um, so logical explanation for everyday action. So like, why do we elect senators? Um, proverb interpretation. So what does a stitch in time saves nine mean? Um, and these all tasks tap into like social and moral reasoning, conventional knowledge. This also provides kind of an arena for like idiosyncratic responses. Uh, and this is why you tend to have like a big long write up. And so if if someone if you're a uh, client is giving you really typical like non-typical responses um you may want to recommend that they get kind of a more personality based kind of more clinical diagnosis um because there's some personality disorders that have that like kind of a tip not atypical i mean having you know quirky responses that's that's not a bad thing by itself um but it can be a symptom of uh, certain personality disorders, as well as kind of early warning signs for uh, more serious clinical disorders, as well as um, potential uh, like brain damage. So it's helpful uh, for referrals. And that's why having uh, experienced clinicians is really, really a key piece here. So you can get a better sense of like, what is typical? And atypical is not bad, but it can signal that there's more to the story here. So letter number sequencing, this is an optional subtest. 
Um, it's only in the newest versions. You don't need it for the verbal IQ score. Um, but oh, it's it's effective. So you ask, um, you're pre you present a sequence of letters and numbers, and the subject has to sort them in a sequential order. So so like Z three B one two A, and then the response has to be like one two three A B Z. And obviously they're not this nice and tidy, um, especially given that this is one area that I, I uh, tend to struggle in. So I made sure that they were really nice and tidy. Um, but it taps into working memory and sequential processing, and it's also subject to uh, like anxiety and stress and psychopathology is I know a strong word here, but it gives you some basic idea of what's going on. Uh, raw scores for each test are converted into scale scores, and so there's they have a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of 3. And so two, you're given two sets of scales. One is kind of age-adjusted norms, and so this gives you ability compared to other individuals in the normative sample of the same age. Uh, this allows kind of peer comparisons, but you can't really do cross-age contrast. Now next, you've got um, kind of reference group norms, and so that's ability compared to a group of individuals in the normative sample based between ages 20 and 34. And this allows for contrast across ages because everyone is compared to the same reference group. Now, um, obviously, like younger kids, like the average younger kid is gonna score worse on uh, the reference group norms compared to, like they'll score below average because just younger. Uh, relative to like adults, um, so like 15 versus, um, you know, 35 versus, you know, an average 15 year old's gonna score at average for the norm based, so they'd have a score of 10 um, in the age adjusted, but below 10 in the reference group. And so that's why it's really important to know and think about like your reference groups so that you can kind of have that context. Cool, so scoring. Now combine all these subtests. Um, there, uh, there are age-adjusted scores that are then summed, except for that optional subtest. And so uh, the results in score, so uh, the average is, is a 10 or is 100. And so there are 10 of these. And so ANOVAs don't seem to show a significant age effect on IQ or index. Now I'll talk more about this later. Um, and that was kind of the goal to have it be kind of age kind of immune. Um, and so if you age adjust, you really shouldn't see an effect because you've already sucked out that age effect. And so this resulting score gives you your verbal IQ. And it has a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15, which um, it's really helpful to have kind of similar metrics because that standard deviation of 15 versus 16 makes a difference. I And the math is way easier for the standard deviation of 15. That's why I like it um, from a like just basic calculus, like head calculation standpoint. OK, so um, that's it for this little chunk. I'm going to upload these and um, keep going. Um, so you have everything. Cool. See you very soon.